excited about sharing this group of messages with you over the next four weeks because this is a topic that uh, I would just say I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. I mean, because we're going to be talking about the church and your particular role in that. If you know me, you know that I absolutely love the church. I love God's church. I don't necessarily mean the place, right? Like, like these four walls that surround us. Although you, if you know me, you also know that I am a huge believer and a proponent in local congregations and serving the needs of the community. But the church I'm talking about is the church that describes that's described in the Bible. And if you're not really familiar with what the the church of God is really all about. Uh, I've got something just to kind of get us started, so go ahead and take a look. Today, all over the world, we are gathering in large groups and small, in different places and different languages, in buildings and schools, empty spaces and open fields, in our homes and on our phones. Some come together in freedom while others have to meet in secret. Some will sing the old hymns, while others are singing something new. We'll all learn different things from the same Bible worship the same God in different ways. We are the church, the body of Christ, different pieces molded together by the hand of God. Today, all over the world, we are gathering as one. church, as evidenced in that short video clip, is not a place. It's, it's not a place, although we have places that we call churches. It's not a place, it's a people. It's the people of God. It's believers in Jesus all around the globe that are installed upon and grow upon his foundational principles. It's what scripture calls the body of Christ. And you saw it on the screen there, 1 Corinthians 12.27 Right, it says, now you are the body of Christ. All of you that are believers in Jesus, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. I absolutely love this verse. I love this verse because what I know and what I've seen is that the strength of the Christian church around the globe is unity in this essential. Is unity in Christ. In unity in Jesus. What he stands for and of course what he died for. And you might be thinking, well, what is that? What, what did Jesus come here for? What did Jesus actually die for? Well, he died for the lost, and he died for the broken. And you might be thinking, well, that's not me. I'm not lost. I'm not broken. But can I tell you that at one point and another, all of us in our life really were there. We are all lost and broken at some time. Unfortunately, when people find themselves in that particular scenario, in that particular season of their life, these are some of the times where they feel the most worthy to actually be part of the church. Because they feel that their brokenness makes them too not palatable for the church. Like, I don't belong where all of the cleaned up people are because I have this, this brokenness. And can I tell you that that can be no further from the truth and that it's certainly nothing that we would find in the Bible. I'm here to tell you that if you are hearing that and if you're, or if you're watching this online or you're here today and you are feeling lost and you are feeling broken and God is telling you that you need to clean up before you come to him, can I tell you that is a lie. It is a lie of Satan and I want you to know today that you belong here. That you belong here. For the next four weeks in this series, You Belong, we are going to be looking at how God views you and your place in his church. And the reason that I think this is important is because what we have now are multiple, multiple generations of people that are seeking to belong somewhere. They are seeking to belong somewhere. They're crying out for people to hear them, to speak to them, to lead them in truth. 
And we, the church, are called, commissioned, and certainly equipped to give the lost and broken souls of this world what they are looking for. Not a place on this corner or that corner, but a people. A people that love, laugh, pray, cry, and learn together, all for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. 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 So today I want to start this, I want to start by sharing a really familiar story with, with, that will be for some of you uh, in Scripture, but it has kind of a lot of layers to it, and it represents different people groups that encounter and respond to God, both in the ancient world and we can look and see who these people groups represent today. Uh, it's actually the last of three loss and redemption stories told by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. And so we just studied Luke's gospel during Christmas time, and we looked at the first you know, couple chapters, and we saw Jesus' birth. We're going to fast forward now to, to Jesus full-on in ministry, and he's teaching his disciples, and he tells them these three parables. It's actually uh, three loss and redemption stories told by Jesus in the gospel of Luke. He talks about lost sheep, and he talks about a lost coin, and then he talks about the story that we're going to share today, the lost son or the prodigal son. So that's where we're going to spend some time. It starts at Luke chapter 15, verse 11, and it continues to verse 32. But what we're going to do is we're going to break this story into two parts. And the reason is, is because this is a very well-known story. And sometimes it's easy when we read through Scripture to, uh, when we see things that we already know, to think that we already know everything there is to know. Uh, and, you know, just kind of breeze through it. But if you know me, you know that I am a respecter of the spirits leading through and studying and teaching scripture. So I want to move through this well-known story just a little bit slower. I want to move through it in two parts just to see what God might have for you in your current season. How this may hit just a little differently than it has before. Now, many of God's stories we can read throughout scripture from the beginning and the end are lessons. They're lessons for us, including this one. So stories, when you look at them, you can kind of look and see kind of an inductive Bible study method. You can look and, and realize that there are three components to it. There's always a problem, there's always an example, and then there's some sort of solution. In fact, most of Jesus' par par most of Jesus' parables are really presented like this. He makes some sort of observation, he tells some sort of really awesome story, sometimes an obscure one, relating to, to that particular observation, then he provides a solution, or he interprets this for the people that are listening, and by virtue then us. So we would call that today application, right, for our own lives. It's actually a great way, a great way to look at scripture when you're reading through it, particularly when you're looking at the teachings of Jesus. So here's the characters that are found in this particular parable, again, Luke 15. So uh, Luke 15, and you've got uh, the three characters are the father, and then you've got a younger brother, and then you've got an older brother, right? Everybody's with me so far. You, you guys, a lot of you know this already, right? You've got the father, who is a representative of this patriarch of the family, also a representative of Father God. Uh, and then you've got the younger brother, who is really representative of all the lost and broken people in the world, those who have sinned, uh, as we'll see, him being caught in uh, sinful behavior, and then the older brother, who is represented by the self-righteous people that are listening to this uh, parable, we would call them the religious leaders or the Pharisees. The story is interesting because it seeks to distinguish between these two people groups, one represented by the younger brother and the other represented by the older, and what many people don't see in this story, because we often look at it from the younger brother's perspective, is that both the older brother and the younger brother, they suffer from the same problem. They have the same problem because at different points, they, they find themselves, each of them, at odds with their father, who has nothing for, but compassion for both of them, who has nothing but love for both of them, who has nothing but concern for both of his sons. He just wants them, in this case, to be home with him. The title of today's message is Drifting Closer to God. And I pray that God will bless you in the sharing of his word today and that his spirit would enlighten you to see the application in your own life. If you have your Bibles in, you can turn to Luke chapter 15 or you can scroll there on your YouVersion Bible app to share the first part of this two-part story that we're going to look at told by Jesus 
to his disciples and others. So I mentioned that there are three parables in Luke 15. Now, I'll just kind of set the stage for you to give you some context and read you the opening of uh, uh, what Luke writes here uh, to see what characters Jesus, who Jesus is actually speaking to. Remember, this takes place in ancient times, and so you're there in the Middle East and kind of get a picture of all of that. And Jesus is, is, is sitting, standing. We don't really know. He's telling a story. We know that. He's got a captive audience in Luke's, Luke 1, excuse me, Luke 15, 1 through 2. Actually, it tells us who that audience is. So, verse 1 says this. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So, right here you get the idea of who's going to be listening in and who was often listening in onto Jesus' uh, teachings. So then he records the first parable, a parable of Jesus about sheep. So sheep, about a hundred sheep actually, and one of them goes astray. The illustration here is that God goes, the good shepherd goes and looks for that lost sheep, right? Illustrating that God has a plan to pursue and save the sheep, which would be also for us. He has a plan to pursue and save us. On the other side, you have this 99 sheep who are, you know, secure in the, the pen of sorts, but they're not particularly concerned about this missing sheep. But the shepherd, the shepherd is, and he goes after and finds it. The second parable tells uh, that of a lost coin. A lost coin, and there was great diligence that was shown in looking for this coin, and then this lost coin was found. You might not think this is a very big deal, but in this particular sense, Jesus uses this parable to illustrate kind of the time and the things that were going on, right? So money was not, you know, it was hard to come by. So, so to lose one coin, even out of ten, was going to be pretty, you know, it was going to have an effect on you. You know, perhaps financially, certainly emotionally. So finding this coin was a big deal. And, of course, it's something that was lost and then, of course, had been found. The result, Scripture says, was immeasurable joy. Finding what was previously thought to be lost forever. And then finally, our topic of scripture for today, this parable of the lost or the prodigal son. So start, start reading in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11, and where we find this story. And God's word says this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now you have to understand culturally what's going on here, right? You have to put yourself in the position of a, a Hebrew family in the ancient times. And so if a son would come to a father and ask him for his share of estate before his father had gone on to, to, to have passed away then this would be the same as wishing death upon them. Right? This was not something that was, was taken lightly. It was not, hey, Dad, can I have 20 bucks? He was asking for something pretty significant. Verse 13 says, A few days later, the young son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. There he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He was hungry. He persuaded the local, a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. This is another significant point. Again, you could breeze right through this and think, okay, well, he didn't have any food. He just had to work for these pigs. He was going to eat the pig food. Whatever. But you have to understand the context that he would not, as a young Jewish man, he would not, not be able to, he's associating with the most clean, unclean animal in the Hebrew history. Pigs, pork, is this not, it's not kosher. So if you're familiar with that, right, kosher is not just a plastic dill pickle. There's a whole like, line of foods that are kosher. And it really means it's a preparation, how it's prayed over and how it's prepared. And so kosher food would be very important that they eat this, right? Um, in keeping with the religious law, which is what 
They did. So here you have him now, right? He's gone and received this inheritance from his father, basically wishing death upon him. He squandered it all, and now he finds himself in... Re if you want to talk about the lowest point, not only is he really just destitute, but now he is with swine, right? The most unclean animal in his religion. And he is in there, and he is thinking, maybe I'll just eat their food. This is how far he's fallen. It's a big, big big deal. Verse 17 says, when he finally came to his senses, he said, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So here's what's happened. The son has done the unthinkable, right? Asked for his inheritance. The father has honored his request. The younger son is out living it up in, you know, Middle Eastern Vegas. And he's just doing anything that he wants to do. And he goes further and further down this path away from his father. And as he goes further and further down the path away from his father, he gets hungrier and hungrier. Now listen, he gets hungrier, literally, but can I tell you, if you really want to read this with spiritual eyes, you can see that he gets hungry relationally. He's missing out on something that is intrinsically important that God has put in each and every one of us, that we were wired to be in relationship. And his relationships are anything other than broken right here. And so this is where he's at, and he's hungry. He's hungry. Let's look at it literally. Have you ever been hungry? Mm. Yeah, some of you are hungry right now. Like, yeah, speed this up. It's time for lunch. <laughs> some of us, I mean, we get hungry, but maybe you've been so hungry that you've been starving, absolutely starving. I remember taking road trips when the kids, when they were younger, and with the kids when they were younger, and they were always hungry. They were always hungry, and God bless them. I mean, I would be hungry too. I'm sure I was when I was younger, but, but, but they would be hungry at different times, and it just, it was like, wait a second, you all got to be hungry at the same time. Let's make this work. But they would be hungry, and sometimes we would have some of them that they would get, and you know this if you have children, so they would get a little, they would get a little angry, you know, when they get hungry. They get a little angry. Mm -hmm. And that's never a place you want to be in a car with anybody, particularly children. So they get hungry. So what happens is, though, as a father, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I got one or two choices. I can just listen to all of this back and forth, or I can make a decision to take action and do something. And so obviously we make a decision, and we pull over and we get something to eat. But if I kept going, I kept, would our hunger be satisfied I kept going? No, it wouldn't. Would, would, would anything be any, any better in, in the eyes of the hungry people in the car? No. Would my relationship with them get better? Definitely not. It would have been, it would have been bad. Probably, you know, a, a, a mutiny of sorts. But here's the thing. The longer that you go, the longer and the farther that you travel without eating, the hungrier you get. The first message point is this today. The farther that you drift from God, the hungrier you get for his presence. The hungrier you get for his presence. Now, now you can stop and grab a quick bite, right? Spiritually speaking, you can stop and you can get your quick fix. And you can get your, your, you know, your hour a, a week, or you can get your, you know, your Bible study once a week. You can get that and get a quick bite that's going to satisfy you for a moment. But that's not God's intention for you. It's going to satisfy you for a moment. But God prepares a feast for you. He prepares a feast for you. He has sustenance for not only for a lifetime, but for an eternity. Provision forever. That's what God is offering. Never be hungry again. The text says that the younger brother finally came to his senses. This is not an aha moment. This is not, well, I guess I'll go back to dad. You know, This is not because he would have been shunned from the community. This is an oh-no moment. Like, what did I do? What did I do? I've given up the only thing, the only thing, the only relationship that was core to my provision. He was probably thinking to himself, in my father's house, there was love, and I walked away. In my father's house, there was nourishment, and I left it on the table. In my father's house, there was shelter, and I gave up that covering for the company of swine. Verse 20 says this, so he returned. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love 
and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. I want to just stop and just tell you about this because this, again, if you read through this, you can see, you can just get this picture in your head. Okay, this is a son coming home, and this is a dad going out to meet him and forgiving him and welcoming him back in. Remember, he had taken his share of the estate and squandered it. This is not just a relational thing between him and his father. It is a social problem for him as a Hebrew man. Because this son, in coming back to the village, in coming back to the town, the townspeople would meet him at the, at the edge. Not just him, anybody that was in this situation. They would meet him at the edge of the town, and they would do this thing called the kazaza. And the kazaza is, is they would take pots, and before they entered into the city, they would take these pots and they would throw them at the feet of the shamed. And basically, that's really what the kazaza is. It's a shunning. It's saying you are not welcome back here in this town. And so what's happening is, listen, the father is running. Another thing that you wouldn't see in this particular culture, right? Because he would have to lift up his, his, his skirt of sorts and run and run to his son. Meanwhile, you've got all these angry people here ready to throw pots. They're confused why this father is running. Like, hey, we're, we're going to do the kazaza. What are you doing? This guy squandered all your wealth. He, all your wealth. He wished death upon you. But this is where... This is where they were at. And so he goes home. He goes home to his father and he comes to the town. He comes to his senses. He returns and his father comes running out to him. Filled with love and compassion, scripture says, he runs to him, embraced him, and kissed him. Verse 21. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead. And now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he was found. And the party therein began. This is a redemptive portion of the story. This is where it all comes back around. Jesus telling this story. The younger son comes home. He confesses. He confesses his shortcomings, his sins, if you will. He acknowledges that the father is under no obligation to welcome him back. Act of humility. And here's the picture I want you to remember. I want you to get that picture of him coming back into this town. Because before the younger son can ever utter a word, at least based on what we read in scripture here, before he can even open his mouth to bear his repentant heart, his father pursued him. Right? His father pursued him. He ran out to greet him and bring him home. Second point is this. No matter how far you drift from him, God is constantly pursuing him. You, you can bank on it. Scripture says that he is never far from us. Even in our most desperate, destitute seasons of life, God is always calling out to you. Let me just give you two examples in Scripture. Quickly, one is in Genesis. In the book of Genesis, go all the way back to the beginning. You can see Adam and Eve, God's creation in the garden. And then they eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this is a bad, bad problem. And now they notice they're naked and they're shamed and they don't know what to do. And they hide from God. And so God does what? God calls out to the man. In Genesis 3.9, he says, but the Lord called to the man and he said, where are you? Now, God doesn't need to do this. He knows where everybody is. He knows our innermost thoughts. He knew exactly where the man, Adam, was. But he's calling out because he wants to know. He's pursuing his creation, even though his creation had betrayed him. He is pursuing his creation, and he's asking a question. And here's the important part you have to understand. He's asking for a response from the man. He's asking for us. He says, where are you? That's a question. Where are you? And then, of course, you know the rest of the story. He says, well, I hid because I was naked. And so there's a conversation. And then some reconciliation starts. And, of course, it leads into, really, the story of Jesus that we're reading. 
And then you get the story of Lazarus. Lazarus, Mary and Martha were the, uh, the sisters of Lazarus. Lazarus had passed away. He died. And this was one of Jesus' dearest friends. This family was very close to him. And he is delayed in going to help him because Jesus is full-on healing and raising the dead at this point in his ministry. But he gets there a little late. It's really the only time in Scripture that we see Jesus cry. It says, in fact, Jesus wept, arguably the shortest person in the Bible. And he's there a little late. But when he gets there, he says, he says something to this effect. He says, as, as he's sitting there with Mary and Martha, and everybody's crying. Lazarus is dead. He's been in a tomb three days. right? And so they're saying, do something, do something, do something. And they think it's too late. And Jesus knows it's not too late. So even through tears, Jesus says, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. And then he tells Lazarus to come on home. In fact, John 11, 30, John 11, 43 says this. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And what happens? We know that Lazarus, of course, did come out. The father in this story, the father in the story of the prodigal son, was so happy, overjoyed, because his son that once was lost was now found. He was once drifting Away, but now he was drifting closer to his father. Now, that story, right, just that portion of that story, that often touches people very, very deeply. And maybe it's had the same effect on you here today. It affects the people that are listening, it affected the people that were listening to the story then. In fact, you can almost see the tears streaming down their dust-filled faces. The disciples and the others that are there, and they're listening to Jesus tell this story, this incredible redemptive story about a son who had done the unthinkable and was welcomed home by his father. You can almost see this on the faces of almost all of the listeners as they hang on every single word of Jesus. Now, I say the majority. I say the majority because there was another group that couldn't quite grasp this story. They couldn't quite understand why the father would welcome home this man with a repentant heart and why he would give him another chance. And Jesus addresses them at the end of the story, which, cliffhanger, we will look at next week. So as the team comes up, I just want to give you an opportunity because we've done a couple things today that should help you understand a little bit about who Jesus is. Right, we've read some of Jesus' very words. We shared a communion earlier on in our service, a representation of what Christ did for each and every one of us on Calvary's cross, how he went to Calvary's cross, his whole mission. Can I tell you that God's whole mission from the very beginning of Genesis in that garden, when he reconnects with that, when he finally gets Adam to respond, this is a plan that has been unfolding ever since then. And the culmination of that, right, the Messiah, Jesus, is what we see on Calvary's cross. And his shed blood, of course, is what we, is the atonement for all of our sins. And so when we have that little cup, that's what it represents. And so, so if you've wondered about that today, or maybe you're just tuning in to, to church for the first time, Maybe you've never been exposed to the gospel before. Maybe you've never understood what this thing called sin is. This story of the loss of prodigal son. Maybe you can identify with this. And you're wondering, you're wondering, how could I be redeemed in this way? That is, maybe you have been running from God for a long time. But can I tell you, God has constantly been pursuing you. He's just waiting for you to turn around and put his arms. And he will put his arms around you and welcome you you home, and the way you do that is by putting your faith, the wary one telling these stories, by putting your faith in Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, we want to pray today, God, first of all, God, we want to thank you for the measure of word that you have given us today, God. We want to thank you for the incredible things that we see, the incredible truths that we find in Scripture each and every time that we read it, God. We pray that you would continue by the power of the Spirit to lift those words off these pages or off that screen so that we can hide them in our heart, so that you can use us to be your vessel in this world. And we can use that then to live our lives fully for you. If you're here today or you're watching online and you have never begun a relationship with Jesus, 
And that means that you have perhaps been running from God for a while. They say, well, I don't believe in God. So that's okay. That doesn't mean God doesn't believe in you. In fact, God has been pursuing you all of your life. And right now, if the Holy Spirit is putting it on your heart to make a change, saying there are some things that are going on in your life that you just need to get rid of, and you're wondering what to do with them, well, Jesus is there for you. Because he takes all of those things we call sins, and he takes them all to Calvary's cross. And that shed blood covers all those sins. And what it does for us as believers in Jesus, it makes us a new creation. A new creation in Christ, totally forgiven, totally redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. If you're here today, you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's as simple as confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus raised, that God raised him from the dead. Saying, Lord, I want you to, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to be a new creation in you. I give you all of these things that don't line up. I give you all of these sins, God. I don't want them anymore. Make me clean. Make me new. Make me whole. If you made that decision today, you became a believer in Jesus. And on behalf of the church, I want to open, I want to welcome you with open arms because you have become part of the family of God. God, we love you. God, we honor you. God, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.